Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Ryan. And I'm Heather. And this is Confidence Through Cabaret, the podcast. And today we are talking all about movement modalities. And we are doing that with the incredible, fabulous founder of Body Couture, Janice Isserman. Hey, Janice, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. We're super excited to be having you with us. I am um, very, 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 very excited. Yeah, is it? <laughs> we've just uh, we've just been talking pre-show, and we're very excited about this. We have. Um, I'm already taking notes because right? I'm I'm so ready for this. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. We were getting, I remember when we talked, because spoiler alert, everybody we've talked before, um, we uh, we were talking about a couple of different things and I was like, I now I need to have this whole process be done. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> right, my everything in my upper body is locked at the moment. I'm like, you know what would be great? <laughs> <laughs> yep. So we'd love to know, and tell us a little bit more about you. What is My Body Couture? You know, how did you get started? My Body Couture is a one-to-one -one fitness studio. I actually do have a bricks and mortar space, but I also do online work with people and I help people feel better in their bodies. So that has a very broad meaning. I work with people to get rid of body aches and pains and discomforts and anything that's actually holding them back from living their most amazing life. So sometimes people have the idea that this is just for sedentary folks, which it can be, but I have had on both ends of the extreme, I've had one woman who didn't go to the gym for 43 years. And on the other side of the extreme, I had somebody who won five Olympic gold medals. So it's really for everybody. It's for anybody who just wants to be able to move in a fully expressed way. And so for some people, that's going to be going out in the garden, playing with grandkids, playing with children, traveling. For other people, that's going to be apparently gold medal athletic performances. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. But of course, um, the, the pain that we feel in our body isn't always associated with our exercise or lack of it, is it? No, it's not. No, it's not. And actually, one of, the, one of the biggest categories that I have is people who come to me and say, well, it's just because I'm aging. And that is such a huge mythology that culture perpetuates. So it's really super ridiculous to me that we basically tell anybody under 35, nothing. And then as soon as you're 35, we say, well, this is just how it is. And we don't really give people tools, tricks, techniques, or a pathway so that they can feel better in their body. The lifespan in North America is around 85. So we're really then looking at telling people that they're going to be suffering in their body for 50 years, which is the craziest thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so what what drew you to, to to getting into this? You know, what was your kind of what was your your, you know, eureka moment that sort of said, right, this is this is where I need to put my my focus. Yeah, I was an artsy kid. So I was a singer and I was on the yearbook committee and I was doing, you know, cutting out pictures out of magazines and building little collages. I was not athletic. So that is actually part of my approach is that we don't have to be athletes in order to actually feel good in our body. When I went away to university, I discovered for the very first time in my life that I actually did enjoy an athletic endeavor. So in high school, I remember sitting in my high school phys ed teacher's office crying because my phys ed score was bringing down my whole academic average. And like, oh my this, God. Was, this was not the way to go. <laughs> um, so it was a big moment for me to actually discover any kind of physical activity that I loved because mm. prior to that, really, like I was actually like a musical theater kid, you know? Right. And so I discovered running, which is actually nice. super hard on your body. And so yeah. because of that childhood lineage where I'm, you know, sitting, cutting out pictures and I'm singing instead of actually working out and playing volleyball and doing like, active things, I actually ended up getting injured. And the story that I just told you is kind of the story of my own life. So I now own a business doing what I wish had been available at the time. So I went off to the sports medicine doctor and I went to the chiropractor and I went to the acupuncturist and I went to a rolfer and I went to, you know, you name it. And I did it. And what would happen is it would be fine. And then I would go back running and it would not be fine. And I was young. I was like 
17, 18, 19, somewhere in there. And so that's still an age when our body is supposed to spontaneously kind of recover and nobody could figure out what was wrong. So that accidentally set me off on a life path where I actually developed the work that I do now because I have a body myself that is much more an artist than an athlete. Right, I see. So how is your work different to chiropractors or physiotherapists or osteopaths or all of those or acupuncture even? How, how, what is it that you actually are doing? Good question. So I'm actually taking a bunch of fitness modalities, things like Pilates, yoga, Yamana body rolling, critical alignment therapy, some of those you might be familiar with, some of them you might not be familiar with. And I'm mashing them together. And then that artist part of me walks, watches the body walk in the door, and I kind of evaluate what I see and intuitively start assigning exercises to that body. So it's not really coming from one pure body of work and it's not following an extreme methodology, but it's exercise based work. Right, 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 right. I see. And so how do you find that? Um, so because I know that we when we've talked in the past, you, you talked about managing pain and how that sort of manifests in the body. How do because a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of people who don't quite understand or don't necessarily believe that certain uh, emotions and experiences can yes. be stored in the body. Um, how would you explain, how do you explain that to somebody, especially if they're, they're really kind of like, no, that's not a thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's a common response because in our culture, we divide the brain and the body. And we like to think that we're rational beings mm -hmm. who sometimes have emotions. There is actually research that shows these things go in both directions. So we will feel emotions in our body and then our brain will start talking or sometimes we feel it top down, mm -hmm. but it always is a loop. It's never not a loop. There's, there's no emotion that has no bodily sensation or no bodily response. Mm -hmm. So because I work one-to-one -one with people and I always have, so I've done this for 15 years this year. And part of that was part-time, part of this, part of it's full-time. And the part-time matters because I actually had another job. So this is a career change for me. Sure. Because I had another job, I couldn't just go work at a gym or go work at a facility. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to start seeing people in my apartment. And that meant that I only worked one-to-one -one with people. And this part of the story is super important because I was always in a private space with my clients. And when I say a private space, it's not like going to a big box gym and hiring your personal trainer where yes. you're in that facility with everybody else's energy and everybody else's business. It was literally like people coming to my personal apartment mm -hmm. and they're just in my living room with me, which is a really homey environment. And so I, it took me a while to actually really pick up the patterns, but eventually I noticed as we start to do this release work, it's particularly the release work where we're getting tension and compression out of the body, people would start sharing these stories. And the stories are things that I don't think that people, when people walked up the stairs to see me, they weren't like, oh yeah, I'm going to talk about how I hate my husband today. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what started to happen because as we kind of unpeel that compression, oh, there comes whatever emotion is stored in that tissue, whatever emotion has been compressed and that we haven't had time or space or capacity or availability or privacy or what have you mm -hmm. in our life to start unpeeling. Right. And so over the years, and, and when I opened my commercial space, I actually replicated that. So I actually yeah. opened it in a building from 1910 or 1911. So it's, it's, a, it's an old building. And especially in Canada, that's like old as the hills. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, and it actually used to be an apartment building that's now cut into a commercial space. So right. people walk in and, and it's got that feeling of yeah. I'm in that private homey space. And if you go to my website and check out a few pictures, I've actually decorated it like an apartment. Yeah. So people come in right away and they're actually in that different mindset where they feel almost more like they're at home than in a gym. And yeah. when we start peeling open the body, we see those cracks and those flaws and those 
you know, difficulties in life. We see people talking about money. We see people talking about their marriages. You know, I've heard a lot of stories about cheating and different, different relational issues. We talk about things that happen in childhood. We talk about careers that we don't like. You know, I had a woman tell me she hates the business that she owns. And I'm like, Ooh, yeah, that, <laughs> that's a hard one, right? Do it. Yeah. Um, and her body was really tight and compressed and in a lot of pain. And that's why, because she's literally spending eight hours a day kind of gripped down doing this job that she doesn't want to do anymore and felt like there was no pathway out. So I'm not a therapist, but what I am is a compassionate inquiry practitioner, which is a Gabor Mate technique where we ask questions, we actually bring that person into their body, we feel that emotion. And once we feel it, it's kind of fully expressed and we don't have to kind of therapeutically inquire, but we allow the body just to release that. And it, and it changes the nervous system, especially if it's kind of old stuff. Right. So a lot of us are kind of carrying around stuff from our childhood, stuff from old relationships, stuff from past partners, stuff from, you know, we all have this stuff and it, and it just lets the body let it go. So do you, so when you say uh, you, the, the inquiry technique, the compassion inquiry um, technique, uh, uh, what is that? What, what is it? A, mm -hmm. Is it kind of some introductory questions that get that going or, or is it just that it just comes out of your body as you're releasing? It actually tends to just naturally come out of people's body, but I actually am taking that certification to specifically dig deeper into that emotional inquiry mm -hmm. because it can feel unsafe to people. I've never had anybody that I'm aware that it feels unsafe for, mm -hmm. but it is really a gift as a practitioner to be handed that level of, you know, I don't like my husband. I don't like my job. I'm mm -hmm. feeling financially stressed. And so we don't want to end up accidentally re-triggering somebody or making them, putting them in a position where they're feeling unsafe to express this. So I do also want to be super clear that I don't force clients to go there. Oh, it's cool. not, it's not something where I'm like, no, you must, you <laughs> must express this or this technique doesn't Tell me work. your trauma. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> But it's, it's, it's a technique where we say, you know, Heather, tell me where you feel that in your body. Can we yeah. just go with that? Yeah. And, and once you release it, then it'll. Exactly. And the truth is a lot of people, and this includes me, um, I am a lot of people as well. Uh, we, we actually are afraid of these emotions. So we start feeling our chest burning and we feel that shame in there and we feel that yeah. pain in there. And we actually are taught culturally, shut it off, close it down be appropriate don't share that and so actually allowing the body to just hold it and then recognizing that it too will pass is actually often all that people need we don't need kind of intense mindset shifts or different therapeutic techniques we need to let our body just know that like here and now in the present we're okay mm. yeah so when we spoke before you talked about emotional inflammation and that term has stayed Ooh. with me because I have so much emotional inflammation. Um, <laughs> and, and it, and, and this is uh -huh. So my husband passed away two years ago today, actually. And when uh, when he passed away, I didn't really dance for a year. Mm. I did very little. I did. I still did my aerial classes, but I didn't dance mm. because I had actually let go of a huge amount of anxiety and anger and all kinds of things because I've been sick for a long time mm. and I didn't have any strength in my or fierceness that drove me to dance I just yeah. didn't I was like more like a rag doll and I didn't know what to do with that because I'd never felt that that's how I know that I have emotional inflammation because there's yeah. tons more in there I just yeah I can mm. so, so talk to us a little about what that is well, I'm a type A person. And when we talked before we were, yeah, we were totally vibing on that front. <laughs> um, and so what I was taught when I grew up, and this was just, this is just the way it was, you know, I'm, I'm of an age where we didn't have a culture where we had self-expression. We didn't have a culture where we held people's emotions tenderly. And I grew up on a farm. So even amplifying that, you know, <laughs> me, that was just, there was no place for that. Yeah. And so what there was place for, and I know a lot of people can relate to this is what we can accomplish, what we can contribute, what we can do, what we can give things like that. 
And that's partly how a type A personality actually develops in the first place, because we're really valued for what we're doing, not who we are and what we think and how we feel. So typically we grow up and continue to repeat that same pattern. And what we will do is listen to what our culture tells us, which is go do these super type A activities. I just told you a story about the very first activity I ever fell in love with from being an artsy kid to running, which is actually one of the most high intensity things that you can do. And you're basically pounding all of that right into your body. And running was the way that I dealt with any emotion. So I actually have memories of, you know, breaking up with boyfriends or different things going sideways in my university life, you know, being scared that I was going to fail an exam and I would go run it into my body. So I wasn't actually necessarily healthily releasing it out of my body. I was actually in all honesty and reflection, probably just jamming that further and further and further into my body. And so my tissues were actually getting inflamed. I was compressing everything. I wasn't expressing anything. I mean, nobody was, I wasn't telling anybody I thought this, although I do remember a few times bursting into tears because I I was quite sure I was going to fail exams. Like I was a Dean's List student. (laughs) There was no failing exams, but I was so perfection oriented. I had to achieve. I had to be at the top of the list. I had to make sure it was all kind of right from the outside and I really was inflaming my body and I was incredibly um, damaging to my body that's why I got injured and so that emotional inflammation is not ps it's not a real medical condition but (laughs) but it's where we're actually taking our emotions Mm -hmm. and instead of actually processing them we're stuffing them into our body where they do the same thing that arthritis does at the end of it Right. So there are researchers who, who Bessel van der Kolk and Gabor Mate talk about their trauma research and they talk about how our body is carrying all of that. And it often does show up in that type A person that I have worked with as a type of inflammation where there's just that tightness and that hardness and that heat and that like you actually you had a very common story where at some point we just collapse and fall over and we're done. We're out. I got nothing. And so once we start to take that kind of wall of rigidity out of the body, it almost feels like we have nothing. We have no strength. We have nothing. And I remember going through that myself where I was just like, I literally can barely move because I've taken out the wall that was holding me up. Yeah. Which is actually just emotional inflammation. Yeah. I love that phrase because I think yeah. most of us can relate to it at some point or another. Mm. And in fact, my, I, I think, I think I'm still processing a lot of that, but um, I, I think 2020 for a lot of people was oh, quite yeah. alarming for having yes. to have some stillness mm. and yeah. some confinement, particularly for type A's like us, because I mean, the way that I deal with stuff is to just get busier. Yes, yes, yes. And I don't need to process that stuff. And then it goes into the body. And I feel strong when that happens. Because I'm taking stuff done. I'm taking stuff off the list. And and so when you take that away, it is just like jellyfish all of a sudden. Mm. That's right. Yeah. And I think, I think it ultimately links back to do we have the skill sets in our body and in our processing capacities to actually manage those emotions that come up. My theory on 2020, and that's all it is, it's my opinion, it's not a fact, it's not a research project, but <laughs> we, we typically will go to a retreat center to kind of process these things. So, for example, I actually did a yoga teacher training that was on a Buddhist monastery. We were obviously practicing a lot of yoga, but we were also literally on retreat from the rest of the world. Mm. So there was no cell phones. It was in the Redwood forest in California. Oh, wow. It was great. Yeah. yeah. And, and the, it was really interesting because the, the Buddhist nuns and monks were the only other people that we were in contact with, right. but that's actually, that is a place where we can be with those thoughts and feelings that come up when we have that silence and the, problem with 2020 was that a lot of us were really put in that position 
without the benefit of the Buddhist nuns and monks, without the benefit of actually choosing to go on retreat, without the benefit of the teachers, whether it be a yoga teacher or a spiritual teacher, there, there was no guidance. It wasn't like, it wasn't like our governments were handing out brochures on how to actually process these emotions. <laughs> and without other people around us who are actually going through the same thing. I mean, I remember, I remember going the second time to my yoga teacher training and a lot of people were feeling really triggered, but we had each other and we could have these conversations and we could kind of dig into it and we could help support each other. So I actually really felt like 2020 was a year when a lot of us were actually in forcible retreat. And what happens is the brain has nothing to process from today. It has nothing to process from yesterday because it's just a big blank wall. <laughs> <laughs> and so then what starts happening over the course of time is these things from our childhood come up. These things from 20 years ago come up and we don't necessarily have any greater skill today than we did in 2019 to process that because we didn't seek that out. We did not undertake some sort of cultural global retreat. Mm -hmm. And so then I've seen a lot of kind of acting out and rage and anger and kind of, you know, crazy things overwhelm because, because those processing skills aren't there. And that includes exercise. So the government of Canada actually did a research project. They do it every year um, to kind of see where they need to invest in social programs. And exercise was way down. Alcohol was up like 30%. Smoking's up 4%. Marijuana is up, although like it was recently legalized. So, I mean, whatever, but they literally put in the report that that has become people's coping strategies. Mm -hmm. So exercise is down about 33%. And then these other substances are up and it's because we're just in this place where like, we don't, if we don't have a habit of healthy exercise or emotional processing, what else are you going to do? You're going to just grab a glass of wine and have a smoke, damn it. <laughs> right, right. Uh, that doesn't actually sound so bad to me right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, because yeah, because I mean, we need to make it stop. You're like, this just needs to stop. It's more than yeah. I can cope. Yeah, you yeah. do. And, and actually, it's funny you say that because uh, uh, a year ago, actually, Ryan and I were talking about this the other day. Mm. So we've been in lockdown in the UK almost full time for a year. Yeah. Right. We've had little periods of time where we've been allowed to do a few things and then back right. into lockdown. So this is our, our third official lockdown, but it, it never really opened. Yeah. yeah. And and we started, I mean, A type personality. I was doing 15 classes a week online because why wouldn't I? And and but we were exercising a lot and we were yeah. walking yeah. a lot and we were and then as each phase of these lockdowns over 12 months went on. And this has happened across the UK, I think, oh, we, really? this, this lockdown fatigue where people have stopped exercising. Yeah. And, and, and I would never have said a year ago, oh, well, that's okay. It's, these other coping strategies sound great because I was really happy in my exercise. But yeah. now I'm not really doing my exercise. I still have a pole in my living room, but I'm still not doing it. And I'm thinking, actually, the alcohol. So tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this. Yeah. And I mean, I actually, I think one of the reasons is because, because we have that heightened emotion mm -hmm. and we don't know exactly what to do with it. Actually, that exercise that we were doing before in a lot of cases does not feel good to us. So our body is actually interpreting a lot of that as stress and we don't need more stress especially because we have no outlets for how to process that stress. So I don't know what your life looked like before, but we did a ton of cultural stuff. So if there was a festival, we were at it. If there was a play or some sort of music event, we were there. And just having that door shut means that there's nothing to look forward to. There's no cultural outlet. Yep. And my body actually sits in a slightly higher stress zone all the time because mm -hmm. that culture is erased. And yep. like, I, I want to tell you that, you know, Zoom streamed concerts are the same, but <laughs> that's, they're not. They're not. Uh, no. They're not. No. So going and doing that higher intensity activity, I am very body aware and I can read my body quite well because of 15 years of this practice that I teach. And I noticed that there would be days in, you know, last April 
that my body would just feel stiff and inflamed and tight. And I was like, weird, like nothing has changed. I didn't eat differently. I didn't do anything more high intensity. And so that started to really inform part of my own exercise program for the subsequent year, because I noticed that, that I have just a naturally higher level of stress, even though it feels weird because like nothing is going on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's why, isn't it? That's why. It's yeah. because there's nothing going on. And yeah. for eight type personalities, that is our own prison cell. It's yeah. true. It's true. But mostly A type personalities don't want to do more restorative exercise styles, but that's exactly what we need to do because our body's stress meter is like, and we actually tend to feed on that. And we feed on like anxiety feels like fuel for us and so when we're actually sitting in that higher stress zone without those other outlets and inputs we often need to do that restorative yin practice we need to go for a walk we don't necessarily need to hang upside down on a pole although that actually sounds (laughs) (laughs) um and so it's it's actually the opposite of what we think yeah and it's funny you say that because i i Well, I haven't been lately, but I usually do stretch three times a week, but I don't do stretch. I do contortion. Do you know what I mean? I don't do exercise. I do aerial. So, so, and that is, if you're not familiar, if you're listening to this and you're not familiar with A-type, those are examples of, we do, and and I just want to go back to what you just said, that anxiety is fuel for A-type. And that, that is so important to know that if you don't know of yourself being an, an A-type personality, because that used to be, A-type personalities used to be talked about a lot. Mm. Yes. And then, and then that kind of went out of fashion to talk about that. It still exists. Yes. We just mm. use different language and it can get very diluted, you know, into, I do these things, but, but actually if you fit under one category, it's important to know that you are setting your own fires. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because and creating your own fire. Mm. And I would say 90, I mean, because I am a type A person, I think 90% of my clientele are as well. They tend to be high achievers, entrepreneurs, artists, athletes, mm. creative people, etc. And that's actually why they end up in my office because they've gone to the doctor. There's nothing wrong with their body. There's no MRI reading that's showing that anything is wrong. Mm. And so what is going on in their body and a lot of it actually is that their body is under constant tension Mm -hmm. and so they can get a massage and away it goes but then it's going to come back because it's the next time they go and engage in a high intensity activity which is like all the time (laughs) um and so learning what our body could feel like or should feel like when we actually have space in our joints when we actually have a lack of compression, it feels very foreign because to us, that sense of tightness and tension and anxiety and compression feels normal. So I had to learn, oh, that's actually compression. Oh, right. that's actually, oh, that's actually anxiety. And it doesn't, I, I think a lot of us are afraid that getting that kind of body awareness is going to, I, I was, I, it's going to turn us into floppy dolls that do nothing. And, and then we're just going to sit and watch TV for the rest of our life. No, nope, that's not what happens. What does happen is we start to practice some of these techniques. We can sustain our body. We can stop kind of that cycle of pain and unpleasantness and even unhappiness because we actually have something of a blueprint which many think had from childhood of what it can feel like to be neutral. So quite often I'll take clients through a set of exercises, like literal physical exercises. I'll do yam and a body rolling, something like that. And I'll ask them what they feel. And I see kind of blank eyes, but they're sort of looking for the data in their body and they actually feel nothing. Mm -hmm. They feel nothing. And that's the whole point is we need to have a blank canvas because the type A people are like painting over top of painted canvases already. (laughs) And we don't see, they feel nothing. They feel nothing. I know Heather's like, I don't know. Um, (laughs) So, well, it's the same way that we can't. So in our culture at the moment, in the self-help world, 
there's a, there's a phrase called holding space. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you hold space? Space does not exist. It's not some, you know, I'm holding space right now. What does that look like? What does that feel like? It's, it's a concept that actually means nothing. Whereas I can feel if I put my hand like this, where I'm gripping my fingers, I can feel that I'm not, that's actually a movement. Whereas if you like that, what does that feel like? You're now holding space. It's nothing. Right. I don't like that. <laughs> right. And so your joints are doing the same thing. That, that's what's happening inside our joints. So when we have those aches and pains and stiffnesses, mm. we're holding that compression and that feels like something's happening. That's what we get when we go to the gym. We get that burn. We get that feeling. That's what happens when you run. Mm. That's what happens. All physical activity is basically mm. some sort of version of that. I'm actually doing the opposite. I'm taking it out. That's where I start. I mean, I do have work that I do that's that's like Pilates space where you're gonna feel stuff, but we start by pulling it out. Um, so we start by holding that space. Well, how do you describe that feeling, especially if you're that type A person and you're like, I have no idea. I have no information in my body on how to describe this. I have no information in my body for what it actually feels like to have neutral joints. Right. And no information about what it's like to not have pain. Ah, uh, so it's not that they don't feel, it's that they don't know what the feeling is and don't know how to therefore give it a name. Correct. Right.